Darren LeMay and Jonathan Taranzen in culvert replacement project using partial tunneling with liner plate. Darren LeMay is a licensed professional engineer from Idaho Transportation Department in Boise. Jonathan Taranzen is Burns and McDonald's operations manager for the Kansas City Transportation Practice. I'm Darren LeMay from ITD, as, as he said, and uh, Jonathan and I are going to tell you the story of the rehabilitation of the corrugated metal pipe that allows the Portneuf River to flow underneath US 30 in the southeast portion of Idaho. This is a unique project. Not, not only is it unique uh, for Idaho, the state, it's the first time we've ever done a project of this type, but there are only two or three of these types of culvert replacements done in the country each year. A little outline of our presentation. First, I'll be giving some hi history and background on, on the culvert. And then I'll also talk about the design constraints for this particular rehabilitation project. After that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan Tronson uh, for the alternatives analyses uh, discussion and also the design and construction phases of the project. Now, I'm going to start out with a statement you've probably never heard anybody say before in your life, but this is an interesting culvert. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's going to make the cover of Incredible Bridges magazine or anything like that, but if you give me a few minutes to explain, I think you'll agree that this is a, an interesting culvert. I'll start out by giving you some background and history on the Portneuf River Basin, the culverts involved in this project, and the poor condition rating of the main culvert that we're re rehabilitating. This is an overall view of the area just east of the project. The, the culverts in, in question are clear over here on the, on the left side of the screen. On the left side, there's, there's three culverts right here, and they're each 10 foot in diameter. Running along the bottom of the screen here is the current alignment of the US-30. Across the middle here is the Portneuf River. It's a meandering river that flows from east to west in this portion of the state. Up here we have the old alignment for US-30. In, prior to 1947, this, this road, the US-30, stayed north of the Portneuf River the whole way. Um, and what we're looking at here total width is about a three and a half mile stretch of highway. The old alignment prior to 1930 also, or 1947 also stayed north of the railroad, Union Pacific Railroad, which is right here. Uh, until this point right here on the far right, it, it, it crossed the railroad as an underpass. This is a more close up Google Earth shot of the project area. Like I said, we have, we have three culverts right in here and they're all 10 feet in diameter. Uh, the main culvert, which is the one we're rehabilitating, one, runs right, right in this area right here. About 60 feet to the east of that is the first of two overflow culverts and they're each 10 feet in diameter also. The first one's right about here and then 25 feet further to the east is the second 10 foot diameter overflow culvert. In addition, we have in this site, there's a lot going on here. This is the Topaz Bridge that crosses over the Union Pacific Railroad line. Also, this area here, this water flow here is called the Marsh Valley Canal. And then also there's an access road right along here that goes under the bridge um, for access uh, for the railroad. The Marsh Valley Canal takes approximately about 75% of the, the Portneuf River's water flow through it and it feeds a hydroelectric plant, plant downstream about three miles downstream and from there it, it, it feeds irrigation lines for crops uh, beyond that. So most of, most of the time only about 25 percent of the Portneuf River flows through this main culvert that we're rehabilitating. This is a photo that was kind of hard to get a hold of. This is an original photograph from 1947 of the uh, construction of the main CMP. Um, as I've said, it's 10 feet in diameter, and it's constructed of one gauge galvanized steel structural plate, so it's, it's really a th thick material. It's about 239 feet in length, and it supports two, a two-lane highway, US 30, and about 45 feet of fill on top of it after, after this project. And, and this, this all worked from 1947. It worked for good for about 15 years until 1962. And in 1962, there was a flood that washed out uh, some of the fill and some of US-30 itself, actually, over the top of that 45 feet of fill. 
and, and this, prompted, this is what prompted the construction of the two overflow culverts, the two on the right here. This plan sheet is just showing a cross section of the layout of the two overflow culverts relative to that main culvert. The inlet elevations of the two overflows are, are, are two feet higher than, than the, the inlet elevation for the main culvert. I tried to locate a fo uh, photo of the flooding that occurred in 62, but unfortunately I couldn't find one. The big event in the life of this culvert was in 2010 when US 30 was widened from a two-lane highway to a four-lane highway. And this section is, is looking eastbound, um, and it shows that all of the widening uh, for that project was done to the north side of the highway. There was, there was no widening to the south side. Um, ge geofoam or, or um, EPS was utilized for the widening. It can be seen right there in the blue. So there was quite a bit of geofoam on that. And, and, and this also, this, this widening required the extension of all three of these 10-foot diameter culverts uh, by about 35 feet all to the north. Here is a geofoam action shot. This is probably the most action you'll see in a photograph for geofoam. But in this photo, you can see the construction of the new steel girder bridge in progress. And, and this is, again, this is in, in 2010. And then also, you can, al you can also see just to the south of it, the old two-lane um, steel truss bridge, which was still carrying live traffic during the construction of this project. And it's, it's located up here in the far upper right corner. You can see some of that, that bridge there. And that bridge was constructed in 47 also along with the original main culvert from that photo I showed you earlier. The inlets to our culverts are right, right about down in here and they, and they flow underneath here for reference. Um, now here is, here's the geofoam all in place receiving its shot creek cover. Uh, we also see that the old steel br uh, truss bridge in this, in this photo has been removed and that the southern half of the steel girder, new steel girder bridge is being completed. It was a, an inspection report uh, from, from the construction of the new bridge, and it's just, what it's doing here is, I'm just showing you the difference in elevation of the roadways from the new bridge to the old truss bridge. It's quite a bit of difference. Uh, this elevation change, though, was, was necessary in order to facilitate or maintain the vertical clearance for the, for the railroad below with, with these new deep steel girders. Here's another, another photograph uh, from a different angle that shows it even better. I think it's about a, an eight or a nine foot elevation difference total. Now here is the uh, main culvert that we are, are looking at for the rehabilitation on this project that, that Jonathan's gonna talk about. I think this was the worst area that we had. We had the maximum of two, two and a half feet of deformation near the crown of this culvert. And it's only the main culvert, the two overflow culverts are, are fine. And there was some deformation also near the invert of the main culvert, not as much as, as near the crown. But, and at the time of this inspection, this was in 2011, it was a signed MBI um, condition rating of three. This photo though, it, it was taken from the, that 2011 inspection report. Believe it or not, this was the first time that we had inspected these culverts as a state agency. They were just off our radar up until this point for some reason, even after the flood of 62. But needless to say, we don't know when or how this, this damage occurred. We speculate that it, it might have occurred during, during the flood in, 60, in the 60s or maybe during the recompaction of the soil at that time. We just don't know for sure. Photo from that same inspection report in 2011, we see the water intrusion at some of the, the plate seams. And this was, inspection was done in December. So it, uh, that's, that's why we have the icicles. It was really cold out there. Same inspection report, we see here plate failure at the, at the seam, the, the bolt lines. Right there we had some, some breaking of the, of the plate and, that, and this, is, this is over a quarter of an inch thick plate too, so that's pretty bad. Our new project for rehabilita rehabilitation on this goes, uh, from a geotechnical standpoint, it was nice because uh, we didn't have to do any new borings. We were, we were able to just use information from boring logs that were done on the 2010 project. In addition, small pieces of the main culvert were cut out to obtain soil samples of the soil in contact with the CMP. And sounding techniques were also used on the metal culvert to implicate voids in the soil. Now for uh, design con constraints on the current project, the rehab, prior to starting the alternatives analysis, we really had to uh, have a good understanding of the design constraints that we were up against. 
We have the 45 feet of fill, uh, some of which is geofoam. We also have uh, US 30 up above. And then the, we had the access road uh, for the railroad, and also that, that access road was important for our Idaho uh, Transportation Department inspectors to be able to get to the big Topaz Bridge for inspections. And then also the Watermaster um, needed access to that road to operate the head gate for the Marsh Valley Canal for water control. We didn't want any disruption on, on any of these, uh, either of these roads, US 30 or the access road during our construction project. Uh, we also had a specific window for low flows in the river. From the environmental side of things, there, was, there were some, several constraints that needed to be considered, including wetland impacts, aquatic organism passage, and turbidity. Uh, from a hydraulic standpoint, we needed to demonstrate a no-rise condition and maintain water velocities. And as can be seen in this photo, we're standing at the outlet of the main culvert here. That's where this photo was taken. It, it, actually, uh, about 15 or 20 yards away from the outlet, there, there was this pool that uh, we could see a lot of fish in the river, but thankfully none of them were considered endangered. So this simplified the project for us tremendously. So with all of these constraints, the damage to the main culvert, we also had some invert abrasion issues in the overflow culverts. Uh, we selected Burns and McDonnell Engineering to explore remediation options and provide the final design with PS&E documents to go to bid. I'll turn it over to Jonathan Tronson from Burns and McDonnell to walk us through the uh, design and construction phases. Once we knew the design constraints, we could move into our alternatives analysis, and we needed a, a trenchless solution for this particular problem. So out of the gate, the design team really expected this was going to be just a standard liner solution. However, once we got the survey back, the opening that was available in the existing culvert only allowed a five foot inside diameter liner to fit. The elevation view of what that would look like, um, the blue pipe would be the five foot inside diameter liner. It's kind of hard to see the yellow line work on this screen, but that depicts the, the crushed condition of that existing culvert. So a liner solution would create a rise in headwater. Uh, it also creates a perched condition at the outlet so it wouldn't work for fish passage and it increases velocities. So once the liner solution was thrown out, we narrowed this down to three final alternatives for consideration. We had a parallel alternative, a pipe consume alternative, a partial tunneling alternative. And each of these included bev beveled headwall retrofits to improve hydraulics as well as paved inverts in the overflow culverts. This picture depicts the parallel alternative. So this is basically a jack and bore of a 10 foot RCP adjacent to the existing pipe. And then the existing pipe would either be lined or abandoned uh, in place. So some of the constraints with this parallel alternative, uh, it, it requires a very substantial jacking pit. So from a schedule standpoint and environmental standpoint, that was a major drawback. It also has several impacts to the MSE head walls. Uh, as well as potential impacts to the geofoam fill. This is the pipe consume alternative. So it's really similar to a jack and bore. The, the caveat to that is it's a 14 foot RCP that would be jacked around the existing culvert. Has very similar constraints to the jack and bore alternative in that it's, it's going to get into the MSE head walls and the geofoam fill again. And this is the partial tunneling alternative. Uh, so basically this consists of bracing up vertically and horizontally the existing pipe, and then the contractor would remove the existing pipe out ahead of the proposed work and build the, the new pipe behind it as they progress. So between these three alternatives, no, none of these alternatives created a rise in headwater. Caveat to that, the, the, the parallel alternative, the jack and bore alternative did increase velocities. So ultimately the, par, the partial tunneling alternative was selected as the preferred alternative. We recommended a nine foot tall by 11 foot wide ellipse, uh, basically just to minimize the amount of overhead excavation that the contractor would have to do. Several benefits are, are noted here, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on into design. Here's kind of a smattering of some of the details that we provided in the plan set. Uh, so in addition to these details, we, we had some cofferdam locations and dewatering requir requirements in addition to your typical plan set. Uh, the top left of the screen shows the elliptical tunner, tunnel liner plate pipe uh, that was recommended. Upper right is the beveled head wall retrofits. Bottom left is a transition between the US 30 culvert extensions and the new pipe. And the bottom right is the invert repairs for the overflow culver, culverts. 
We also had several notes, SPs and submittals that we required as part of the contract documents. From a scheduling standpoint, this work really needed to be done between October and March. This is when the periods of low flows occurred. We also required some coordination with the water master as part of that. We required a flood emergency control plan in case unexpected high flows were encountered. From the tunnel liner plate perspective, we required the manufacturer's representative to be on site for a pre-construction meeting to talk through the assembly. We also required them to be on site for the first day of tunnel liner plate installation and grouting, available by phone thereafter. From a pressure grouting standpoint, any exposed excavation, once the existing pipe was removed, had to be grouted into place within eight hours of exposure. And we also had pressure limits to, uh, to minimize the, the possibility of crushing the new pipe. To construction, it was a really tight race between three contractors. We had three bids that came in that were within 1.6% of each other. And ultimately, DL Beck was selected as the low bid for 3.3 million. Here's the site. Off to the right, you see US 30 up above, along with those tall MSE walls. Uh, the access road is down below. Contractor had an excavator, bobcat, pump truck, material stockpile. And then down below this, they, they had some other equipment, including some heating equipment, as well as a dingo. Tunnel liner plate looks in all its glory. So this is stacked up adjacent to the MSE wall, and this was later moved underneath the Topaz Bridge. So considering that this work was performed during winter months, we, we needed some temperature control. So a heater was set up at the inlet of the main culvert uh, to blow warm air into the main culvert. And then the picture on the right shows a fan at the outlet end. This was to ventilate the, the main culvert during their torching operations. First thing the contractor did from a construction standpoint was they moved into the overflow culverts to do the paved invert repairs. So this picture depicts uh, some studs that were welded to the inverts as well as some welded wire fabric. They placed several pours of concrete in the first overflow culvert to do the invert repair. That took a little bit more time than the contractor uh, was hoping for, so they ended up using shotcrete in the second overflow culvert to increase production rates. Prior to moving over into the main culvert, they had to dewater the Portneuf River. So this consisted of a, a sandbag coffer dam, and then they pumped that flow over to the overflow culverts. The contractor still had some water issues that they dealt with. There were some springs in the area that we didn't expect, and so they set up a series of sump pumps to keep the work area dry. This is the inlet of the main culvert, so you'll see that there's some geotextile fabric laid down. This was to protect the US-30 culvert extensions as well as the new pipe from abrasion. The aggregate and uh, equipment drove over, and then as you see, the, there's aggregate on top of that. This allows the dingo access to drive over. Prior to doing any removal operations or new work in, in the main culvert, we required a bracing plan uh, to be set up. So the contractor hired their own engineer to design the bracing plan. They came up with 10 by 10 timber posts as their bracing plan in, in the vertical and horizontal orientation. And then something else that their, that their engineer recommended was the use of spiling. So th this is a picture of some of those spiles. These are steel hollow threaded bars that basically get advanced out in front of, of the construction. The purpose of these is it stabilizes the soil up overhead such that when they remove the existing pipe, they don't have a bunch of material falling down uh, overhead. So as you can see in this picture, several holes were cut in the crown of the culvert, and then those spiles were inserted out in front of the work. This drawing kind of uh, shows you what that looks like. So on the left side of this drawing is the new pipe. On the right side is the existing pipe. And then those lines out above the culvert are those spiles that are advanced at about a 15 degree angle. There's a picture showing some of those spiles exposed. So we recommended a 24 inch removal max of that existing culvert. The contractor proposed exceeding that uh, just to increase the amount of work they could get done in a day. The very first section that they removed where they exceeded the 24 inch, they, in, they ended up creating a void that they had to grout into place, so they ended up reverting back to that 24 inch removal. Again, for the removal, they were limited to 24 inches, so they used a combination of cutting and torching. Here's a pretty telling sign, of, uh, or a pretty telling picture of what this looks like. So notice uh, in the foreground, um, so that's your 10 foot diameter new pipe in the background, that shows your, you know, just the, the amount of deflection in that existing pipe. You'll notice a very small hairline crack in the soil off to the left-hand side of the picture. And also around the perimeter, you see this plywood that's sticking out. That, that was used as their bulkhead to retain the grout during pressure grouting operations. 
The purpose of this picture is to just communicate that as the removal advanced through the culvert, the bracing was adjusted such that support was provided uh, directly adjacent to the work area. Once the torching proceeded a little bit and they started having a little bit more deflection in the crown, this dingo was driven up. They had it rigged up to be able to catch that existing plate. And we've got a quick video to show you. So at this point, notice the size of the crack in that soil so that uh, this is their severe deflection at this point is getting ready to drop. And a few seconds into this, uh, you'll see the, the plate drop. Dingo catches it. The worker back is back behind in very close proximity to this operation. And then they just drop it down and get it out of place. The purpose of this photo is just to show you how stiff and, and intact that soil remained after the plate dropped. So you've got the, the existing plate down below that's being held by the dingo and a very tight, stiff soil up above. So it just made the soil really good candidate for this type of operation. So once the existing plate was removed, they could start installing the tunnel liner plate. Uh, so here's the very first ring that was installed. They did encounter a, a void at the extension between the US-30 uh, culvert extension and the old pipe. So that was grouted into place. This whole operation was just rinsed and repeated 24 inches at a time through the culvert. This is what the tunnel liner plate looks like as it's bolted together and advanced through the culvert. Here's some of our project teams. You have Matt Farrar off to the right, Darren LeMay, who's up on stage with me, Brian Poole from the district. All those guys are with uh, Idaho Transportation Department. That's my ugly mug off to the left. And I do want to give a shout out. Uh, I would not have had the opportunity to work on this project had it not been for Jugesh Kapoor, who is a former colleague of mine. So. With all that said, I'd like to open this up to questions. During the project, how many other agencies have used this type of technique to replace culvert? What we found was this was typically used with emergency repairs, where they had to, a pretty quick turnaround on that solution. The, the thing that was different about this particular one was most of the, most of the other projects where they used this particular technique, they had a, a reduced diameter reduced opening compared to the existing culvert. There was a lot more um, involvement and risk associated with the removal, the complete removal of the existing pipe. Uh, do you recall uh, the volume of change orders that came from this project? I would just assume that with something of this nature, you're going to have to have some on the fly changes, right? We haven't had any substantial change orders. So um, one thing that, that I will mention is that the scheduling on this it ended up taking the contractor much longer than anticipated. Uh, particularly, you know, the, the gauge of that existing plate took them a lot longer to remove than expected. So this is, act, this is still under construction as we speak. It, as far as the window that we had isolated, we're well through that at this point. We haven't had substantial change orders though. So far it's, just, it's been more of a, a scheduling issue. The, the one thing that we did battle a bit was we had pretty restrictive requirements as far as the contractor experience, you know, for, for the contractors who would be qualified to do this type of work. And we did fight that quite a bit as far as finding the right contractor to do it. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.